Good day, I'm Martin Gagel with Market Radius Research. It's Wednesday, December the 15th, and we're getting a quick news update from CEO Arnaud Starbusman, uh, CEO of MineHub. MineHub is a developer of supply chain management, trade finance, ESG tracking, and assay exchange software for the natural resources industry using blockchain technology. Remember, this is neither a recommendation nor investment advice. We're here to learn about the company and its industry, do your own due diligence, and come to your own investment conclusions. Uh, Arnaud first introduced us to MineHub about six weeks in October. Please check out that video on this channel if you want to get a deep dive into the company. And since then, we've had solid news flow out of the company, including a significant announcement yesterday stating that BHP and China Min Metals completed the first cross-border copper concentrate trial shipment using MineHub's uh, technology platform. And our Nud is here to bring us up to date on the recent news. Thanks for joining us. But before we get into the recent news, can you give us a quick refresher with a quick one minute overview on MineHub? Thanks. Yeah, sure. Thanks, uh, thanks, Martin. Thanks for having me and the production to come back here. Um, so MineHub is a, it's, it's a platform. It's blockchain based, it's enterprise grade, where we uh, really focus on helping uh, what are currently very paper heavy processes in, com in commodity supply chains to go digital, uh, collaborate on shared data and a shared platform and thereby introduce a lot more efficiency, security, transparency and visibility into supply chains. Now that helps companies uh, with a number of areas, it brings resilience to supply chains. I think we've all seen disruptions and concerns around Christmas presents not arriving. Uh, having a good visibility into your supply chains, both upstream and downstream, is, is of increasing importance. We see uh, companies being much more concerned about the compliance of their supply chains, from a business, especially an ESG perspective. This, again, is an area where we uh, start providing solutions. We see financiers looking to uh, get much more comfortable or much more grip on the risk of the transactions and shipments they're financing. Again, tooling that we provide. And um, we're starting to prove that out, not just by building software, which is what we like to do, but also seeing building it with industry for industry and really seeing it being put to use. And uh, well, I think the recent news flow uh, uh, is a good illustration of that. Yeah, since uh, we have we first talked uh, six, seven weeks ago, uh, you've got, as my count, 10 news releases here. Uh, oh, so good. you've been busy. Uh, why don't we start sort of chronologically, and I believe um, where you uh, launched your trade finance application. Can you give us a quick overview on, on that? Yeah, trade finance it, it provides oxygen to commodity supply chains. It's essential. Everybody needs it. Um, is that essentially pretty, kind of the core of where the, the MineHub platform it can, it starts with trade finance and then you add the other uh, elements sort of on to support that to add extra value? No, actually, the core is the primary business that the buyer and seller do together. Okay. Uh, the way they finance that uh, is, uh, is, is an option for both parties to decide how they do that and, with, and where they look for their financing. But most of them will look to finance it, particularly if we move into the trader space, uh, through uh, foreign working capital, whether from a bank or from alternative lenders, uh, basically because their own working capital is either very limited or it's too expensive. So it's it's an essential capability, but uh, what we have seen with in the trade finance uh, sector is that uh, normal classically uh, the liquidity comes from the big commodity banks, like also my former employer, like ING Bank. They're big participants in these markets. Um, in recent years, though, we've seen a retreat of that capital, um, accelerated last year by the pandemic, as well as some massive frauds that happened in Singapore. We saw banks. Uh, completely leaving the the industry um, and an emerging a trade finance gap that was already at one and a half trillion is now ballooned up to two trillion in the space of uh, half a year. This means that uh, companies that need working capital for their business operations they they look at alternative sources and one of the areas where Minef is focused is on how can we automate risk controls? How can we help companies? Uh, smaller finance companies get do more business with their balance sheets and also how do we make it attractive for the Black Rocks and the Apollos of this world to start deploying some of their investors' money into these uh, ultimately very safe and secure high-yielding investments. Okay. 
So the trade finance basically keeps track that of what's been lent, who's providing the money, what the assets are, and and it sort of interlinks all the those elements that are important to trade finance together. Yeah, if, if you think about these supply chains, the the finance here, um, the, we're talking about high value goods, right? Shipments that are sometimes a million to twenty million, sometimes even hundred million dollars worth, and the rest that the finance here runs is. Uh, is based on the having visibility of what's actually happening on the ground. Is the person, is the bill of lading really assigned to them? Is the trader that emails them, is they, uh, are they who they say they are? Um, the invoice that they're financing, has it not been financed two or three times with different banks? Right? So all that, all that risk management and mitigation, that a lot of it has to do with authentication and being sure about the data, that it's true. Um, that, that is one of the areas where they have a big concern. Now, if you uh, look at what MineUp does, we, we help the buyer and seller do business. We, that nature of the business, communication around that and what is being, uh, what is being transacted is captured on the blockchain. Now, what these parties can do, they can add their lender into the transaction, effectively giving them a front row seat so they can see what's happening. And this uh, uh, mitigates the risk, takes away incentives for uh, for fraud, but it also mitigates the um, removes opportunities for fraud, but it also mitigates uh, a lot of the risk that the financiers have, um, and that ultimately helps them scale their 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 financing. So, what what we are excited about is that we see more and more financiers mandating that their borrowers use uh, digital technology, particularly blockchain technology, as part of the credit criteria. Okay, so. If they impl implement the software, then that's a risk mitigation tool and, a, a, and, and it makes it cheaper to manage as well. So presumably then as well for the trading companies, this will encourage more capital into the market as well, and then hopefully even reduce the cost of capital as well as reducing risk and fraud and mistakes. Exactly, exactly. So it, it creates optionality. Now, whether the, the, the increased capacity immediately translates into lower prices, increased competition, that's, that's more for the financiers and the borrowers yeah. to figure out. But it's, uh, but it's telling like uh, one of our um, early partners and uh, launching customer for this trade finance uh, capability we built is that they'll roll this out over there across their book. So yeah. they'll look to see all their borrowers start using mine up technology in order to for them to be able to finance them much better. Gotcha. So, an, so one of the opportunities being an early entrant into this space is if you're the default platform, if BHP starts telling people or ING starts telling, hey, use this platform, so you sort of get the network effect and, and the first entrant uh, in the network effect, which hopefully makes you the standard or a, a significant standard within the industry. Yeah, I mean, if you look at the news that we put out yesterday, we have a, uh, a project we've been working on with BHP and, uh, and China Min Metals, uh, for instance, uh, one of the largest Chinese companies uh, or in the world, in this space. Um, it's a lot more powerful if um, BHP goes to Min Metals and says, hey, do you want to uh, work with us on innovation, figure out how we can digitalize, and by the way, shall we use MineUp, rather than us going to Min Metals and say, do you want to use MineUp, right? So, yeah, it's a, it's a very it's a very different approach. Um, and similarly for for the Kimuras and other uh, financiers that we're talking to, um, it makes a lot more sense for them to require their borrowers to use the platform, mine up, than it is for us to say, well, now you split and you can go to your financier, they probably will like it. Right, <laughs> makes sense. And for the um, uh, uh, on to the next news release, uh, so we can get through these. You launched your assay exchange app for the base metals, and that's where basically the buyer and seller are providing authenticated information that there's so much copper in this concentrate and whatever information. And I guess that kind of eventually links into the trade finance as well. So everyone's comfortable. You're paying. You're getting what you're paying for. Yeah, it's, it's a fascinating process at the asset exchange. And if you, particularly in, in, in concentrates markets, the, uh, the shipment is what it is, right? It takes as long as the vessel, but then there's a very lengthy settlement process as the parties uh, work on determining what they call the final assay. And that can take several steps, involve umpires, other labs to verify certain parts, 
uh, negotiation of how they how they particularly potentially split variances. And that's exactly a process that we help uh, our users streamline. It's not that long ago that for a concentrated shipment or a transaction, you had the buyer and seller agreeing to meet in, for instance, in Singapore on a certain day, a certain time, uh, both going into the room at the same time, and handing, putting their lab report on the table on paper at the same time uh, to uh, basically compare what each lab has said about the composition of the concentrate and hence what the final pricing will be. So that's that's been replaced by email with passwords, but it's still quite a lot of cloak and dagger stuff. And we build a solution that makes it very instant and real, uh, authenticated on blockchain. And then uh, once we streamline that process, then we can start unlocking the data as well for the for the companies to use. Great. That seems like yeah. <clears throat> The, the industry's got a lot of innovation to go uh, if they're still a meeting in rooms and uh, uh, op opening up their, their file folders at the, the same time. Um, you, in uh, a few weeks ago, you announced that you uh, appointed um, a new chief commercial officer. Maybe just want to uh, highlight uh, their role and their background. Yeah, so Heike has been, uh, I met Heike when she was still with uh, Anglo-American. Um, and uh, in that capacity, she was she was there for 11 years, five years as the group head of strategy, six years in the leadership team of the marketing business, helped set up marketing, the training business, looked after digital, looked after China, India branches, so very seasoned executive. And um, I saw, uh, I basically, I contacted her as soon as I learned that she had left Anglo-American last year. Uh, and asked her to join our advisory board. So she she agreed. She jo she joined. And over the course of the last six months, she, um, she got more and more involved with the company uh, on working on our governance strategy, on some of the uh, sales management approaches. And uh, then um, she, I asked her mel multiple times whether she was keen to join my app, and suddenly she said yes. So, and um, and that's. Um, that's where we are. So I'm very, very pleased uh, to have her on board. She brings a wealth of experience, capability, very all round. Uh, obviously, impeccable industry credentials. Uh, so yes, it's a very, uh, very positive. And when you say uh, um, chief uh, commercial officer, that is, um, that's basically head of sales and marketing, so to speak, of trying to get new customers and and business development, or. Yeah, it's, 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 it's that it's the marketing and, and communications agenda sit there. It's also a commercial strategy, uh, go to markets uh, and, and the execution. Uh, so it's, it's, and it's quite closely involved in that is also what we call customer success. So once, okay. if you think about our strategy, we don't, sales strategy, we don't have an enterprise sales force that's, that's knocking on doors and selling an enterprise solution. What we have is a uh, a network and we've got uh, anchor customers and we will focus our resources to help our current customers onboard their suppliers and customers and so and that's how we will follow the, the network so it's part of it the process is therefore not purely sales and marketing it's also customer success it's um, uh, it's it's consulting, it's execution management, there's particular strategies on how to approach ecosystems, make sure that we run our governance across the platform and across our communities in a fair way. So all those things are, are under your remit. Yeah, because your whole marketing plan and strategy is using the network effect. Um, BHP is using it, that triggers other people to use it. You want to make sure they have a good you have a good 1-800 number for them to call and get support in case they're having trouble with it. If they're happy with it, then hopefully the network expands and everyone's happy exactly. using it. Exactly. So we, we listen very closely to what our customers are saying and where we, we watch as well where the hurdles are and we try to take them away uh, through a good user experience design. Uh, so, um, and then of course we get inbound calls that we, that we take on and especially when we do some news releases, there's uh, the, um, I, the, the inbound calls go from a trickle to a flood, right? So it's, it's very busy at the moment. Okay. All right. Mm. And then moving on, uh, just at the end of November with uh, Kimura Capital Finance's first live metal shipments on the MineHub platform. So, yeah. Yeah. There's nothing, 
for me, that's that's where it's, what it's about, right? We can build software. We've got a yeah. fantastic team, and we can build cool applications and innovations. But ultimately, it's a waste of money and time if it's not being used. So, um, but we don't build them uh, because we think they're great products. We build them only when our customers and users tell them that we they have specific pain points and that we can solve them. So. Uh, with Kimura and PY, fantastic target, exactly target market on the on the finance side as well as uh, PY is a uh, is a, a very small is a small trader. They've got flows going from uh, trades going from South America, uh, concert trades going to China, um, and they need working capital, which is provided by Kimura, and we are helping them do that all digitally. So it's um, uh, it's fantastic uh, partners to work with. Very representative of our future target market as well. And when you say the first live metal shipment with this, does this mean, like, is Kimura the client and then they're getting their uh, partners and customers to use the platform? And does this mean that future transactions they do are going to be using the MineHub platform? Yeah, so Kimura is the lender, the financier. Yeah. And uh, PY is their customer, borrower. Yeah. And PY is the corporate that does the transaction. So, and they work with Kimura to find uh, provide the working capital for this transaction. So, both of them are actually, um, both of them are actually customers, right? PY yeah. on the is a is a user, and yeah. so is Kimura. They're just slightly different um, types of users, and that's that's one of the challenges and opportunities that we have as a platform. We 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 build solutions for different sizes of the market, uh, yeah. which gives us. Um, uh, both an initial challenge of getting, um, making sure that we have a broad offering, but it also gives us the opportunity of a, a very big market and types of uses that we can serve. Right? So it's both, uh, it goes both ways. Yeah. So for Kimura to use this with additional transactions with different companies, they then need to sort of say, hey, we're trying to use this trade finance uh, platform please use it and that'll expedite and simplify this process. And, and they kind of try nudging their uh, borrowers uh, to use the platform. Yeah, this is, I think it's, it's, it's definitely a nudging, um, but it's also a reality that more and more lenders will want digital tooling as part of the credit criteria. Um, yeah. And it's, I mean, it's not just the risk, right? It's uh, the credit risk where you, that's one of the other press releases that's there is on our ESG solution that ties into it. More and more lenders, and particularly companies like Kimura, for them, the um, the ESG profile of the transactions and the, uh, the their financing and the borrowers they're financing is hugely important. So to be able to, uh, when there is a shipment, to provide evidence to the lender that's uh, yes, it's the right material. Yes, it's the destination as agreed. And yes, it has a certain level of uh, the emissions content is below the uh, threshold that they would accept as a finance here. And we know that there's no slavery involved in producing the minerals, right? So those things are very, very important part of the credit set. And this is where the other application ties into. If Kimura is using it, and let's say their partner they're lending to, for whatever reason, doesn't want to use it, like, ah, oh, we, we, we like our old paper-based system, we don't feel like changing. Can Kimura use your platform just to help manage the paper process flow as well? Like, does it sort of, can they use it for general business? And then if it, there is sort of a B2B client with it, they, that helps accelerate it. But if it the client is still stuck on the old system. Oh. It still helps facilitate that old system. Absolutely, it's a very good. Uh, it's a, it's a good administration tool where you keep all your transactions, all your okay. financings, all your facilities in one place with associated documents, communication. It's it's a much more structured than what's currently usually a combination of email and SharePoint. If you're lucky, right? So, um, but obviously the value increases if somebody else is providing you with the documents. If uh, if you can see that, for instance, a certificate of analysis comes from an from a lab, up rather than from the borrower who might have different uh, interest in what the the essay report says. But um, that's a, it's it's think about the phone and and you on an, an iPhone or an, an, uh, a smartphone is pretty nice tool to use by yourself. And I'm sure that people a lot of people use it just just for that purpose. But it becomes a lot more. Useful yeah. if you can start emailing, calling, WhatsApping, that kind of stuff. Yeah. yeah. All right. And um, what else do we have here? So 
uh, Spire Global Data Supports Global Commodity Supply Chain Platform. That's an, a, a ship tracking uh, service and that you integrate so the guys know on the screen, hey, the, the ship's in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean or, or whatever. Yeah, crucial, crucial information, both from a risk, risk management as well as a planning and optimization and scheduling perspective. Um, so uh, Aspire is the source of the lot, a lot of the data providers in this space. I mean, there's a lot of websites out there where you can track vessels and stuff like that. A lot of the data actually comes from Spire. They run the biggest satellite network globally. Yeah. Uh, so we, um, so we, we've gone straight to the source and they've, they're well funded as well. So they've got an innovation roadmap that we um, uh, like to work with them on it because it's, uh, again, that, that real world feasibility enhances the, the solutions for our customers. And um, and actually, I, th th I think this is very thematic of what's going on. And you did mention already your e ESG compliance uh, product, yeah. where because and, and there there what is it different levels one, two, and three of ESG tracking, where the customer wants to know what carbon is sort of associated with the product they're buying, and then they they keep track of that. And that's um, that that's going to be a greater and greater requirement in the world. And so this is basically a, a carbon credit tracking uh, type system through the supply chain? Yeah, the way you should think about it is that uh, it's almost like a KYC tool, but then solution, but then at, for products and for ESG, not for uh, not for the, the, the classic stuff. So- And, and uh, sorry, well, KYC, know your client. Correct, correct. But then now it's now your, now your product, now your supplier, now everything. But so it's yeah. uh, ESG compliance, it's a license to operate. If yeah. not now, definitely next year. Um, the cost of carbon is going to increase, and that will be translated, will be included in products, right? So um, I, I don't think there's any more, any more hiding. However, the burden on companies to prove where the product comes from that if it's, it's uh, meets these twenty or thirty ESG certifications that the emissions content is below certain thresholds uh, and not just for what they produce, but also what they've bought from their supplier and from their su supplier supplier. That is such a massive headache and it, almost impossible to do. Um, and this is really where blockchain technology and platforms like MindUp, they come into their own because we provide almost like a shared ledger, uh, shared accounting solution amongst all the participants in the supply chain where they record where things come from what the emissions content is, and each party can uh, can record it. They can get um, uh, a, a big for a KPMG or an EY, for instance, to come in and sign off on it, bring that independence of data quality. And subsequently, buyers can verify that, yes, it is compliant, it's not compliant. Financiers can verify it's compliant. That's the, we're automating a lot of that headache and make it a, enable it, make it, make it a, and part of the normal course, course of business without much additional effort, which is currently the case. And uh, yeah, finally, the, the news from uh, yesterday with BHP and uh, China Min Metals, which we uh, already have referred to. So uh, they're, they've used it on, on the trial basis and presumably as it goes well, they're going to hopefully keep using it again in the future. And this is a, I guess other companies are going to be looking at this and say, hey, if BHP and MinMetals is doing this, uh, we should give it a go as well. Is that the, the point of this? Yeah, <laughs> definitely. And it's, uh, I mean, BHP is a, is a very important um, customer and partner for us. And um, this follows on from work we've been doing. I mean, this is, we're doing a lot of work with, with, with them and other parts of the market. Every now and then it services above the, uh, let's say the more uh, uh, inner, uh, basically it services into the press and we give some visibility on what we're doing. Um, but it's it's really around continuously pushing the boundaries of digitalization. Last year, uh, through, in, in the pandemic, we did a, a two shipments, two transactions with between BHP and China Bawu, the world's largest steelmaker. Um, and now uh, China Min Metals is one of the, if not the largest non ferrous international companies uh, coming from China. Um, and again, this is really pushing the boundaries, not just doing things digital and more efficient, but also 
uh, bringing innovations uh, to market like, like the SA exchange, like sharing emissions data associated with the shipment. Uh, we, uh, we deployed our network uh, into mainland China, running on in mainland China, which enables compliance with regards to data residents uh, there. Uh, again, no mean feat, especially in these days where some of the geopolitical tensions are not as uh, are, are te- uh, quite tangible. Uh, but it's uh, but yes, it's um, uh, lots of innovations, fantastic teams in both BHP and um, uh, and China Mint Metals, uh, working closely with them throughout uh, the guys in Singapore as well as Shanghai and and Beijing. Our China team has been uh, uh, largely leading this uh, this effort, and uh, yeah, this is very good. All right. Well, we should uh, probably be wrapping up here. That was a great update on how things are going. And in terms of future news, Phil, I don't know anymore this year, but into the next year, is it more um, certain? None of these are, so to speak, home runs. These are all sort of singles and doubles, sort of t- blocking, blocking and tackling that. Hey, you're you're moving the ball forward on uh on the business and that kind of are we are, are there any big news type things we're expected to uh should we looking for or is it just more of these updates uh on that the business is progressing out yeah i think i think the balance will start shifting more towards partnerships and and, and customer adoption and traction in yeah. terms of news flow we will be visible where we can um with, uh, with that um i think what we when we with, uh, when we did our financing uh, earlier last earlier this year, we said we would want to achieve a number of things in 2021. One of those uh, one of those commitments was to really deliver some of the products that our customers want, uh, and uh, and then be able to enable adoption going forward and accelerate that. So this is exactly what we've done. We've delivered um, uh, what we said we were going to bring this year, and now we're going to move into the adoption phase. All right. Arnaud, thank you very much for uh, giving uh, an update here. Uh, Have a great day and talk to you again soon. Cheers. Thank you, Martin. Speak soon. Bye-bye. Bye.